Take us away, Marcus. Hello. Hey, everybody. We're excited to have you join us today. Close your remote so far. Uh, I think it's going great. I'm really excited about this particular section of it. This is where we talk to some of the folks who are the key participants in the community. We're going to take your questions. Community these days is a key part of language adoption. It's a key part of tool work and framework adoption and just really making sure we build a place where people can be productive. So uh, let's go through and ask each person here to introduce themselves briefly. Alex, would you start? Hi, how's it going? Uh, Great. I'm Alex Miller. I work at Cognitect on closure the language and also sort of helping out with uh, a variety of community things. Excellent. Thank you very much. Bridget, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Bridget Hillier. Um, I'm a Clojure developer. Um, I uh, was one of the people who helped start Clojure Bridge, although I'm not involved in it now. Wonderful community building effort. Thank you very much. Colin Fleming is here. Colin, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Colin Fleming. I'm a, I'm a Clojure developer as well. I develop Cursive, which is an IDE um, people have been using to write their Clojure code with. Excellent. Okay, great. And we've got Eric. Eric, tell us about yourself and what you do. Hi, I'm Eric Normand. I write the blog lispcast.com and I teach Clojure at purelyfunctional.tv. Ah, fantastic. And finally, uh, Ryan. Why don't you Why don't you round things out for us? Hey, I'm Ryan Newfeld. I've been doing this little thing uh, today called Closure Remote, uh, and otherwise, I, I run a software consulting company called Homegrown Labs. Fantastic. Well, great. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for being with us today. Uh, and my name is Marcus Blankenship, and evidently, I ask Closure people questions. So that's what I'll be doing today. All right, so let's just start here. And by the way, we are absolutely excited to get your questions. Please use the question app inside Crowdcast below the video to throw questions you've got. Feel free to direct them at people or just broadly, and we'll pick them up as we go. All right, so let's do this. How about you, Alex? You've been with Clojure now a long time, clearly one of the key people in the community. What do you think Clojure's greatest achievement with regard to community is? Well, I'm always proud of our community and the way that we respect people and, and are welcoming to new people. And uh, I, used to, I used to answer a lot of newcomer questions on mailing lists and things like that. And these days, um, I usually don't because there's so many people out there doing that already and do a fantastic job. And so I'm always proud of that. Excellent. Excellent. Let's open it up to other folks. What do you guys think the greatest community and the clo the greatest achievement uh, so far? And Clojure is old but still young. So what what are you guys proud of in the community? You know, I, know, I had something really interesting I noticed uh, today. So my sister's been helping MC the tracks, and she's never actually really seen what I do or any of the people that I interact with on a daily basis. And she made a comment that it was really cool how helpful and sharing everyone was with, uh, with resources. People were having talks, and the speaker didn't even have to give out a link because attendees were dropping links to things they were mentioning as they went. And uh, I think that kind of attitude and helpfulness is really interesting and uh, unique. Fantastic. Any other thoughts from Eric or Colin or Bridget? Things yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the Clojure community because, to me, I've found people that think like I do, and uh, it's, it's just really nice to know that there are people like that out there. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I, I would echo the thoughts that I think it's really good that it seems to be quite a sort of inclusive community. It's always very friendly. Whenever I go to conferences, I always have a great time and, uh, and interacting with people online as well. And I also think it has a really interesting balance between um, it's a very pragmatic community because people are actually using Clojure to, to do their daily work, but it also has um, a, lot of, a lot of people with quite an academic focus. There's a lot of people building things based on, on active research. Um, it's a very interesting mix, I think. I think that's something I really like about it. Okay, great. Bridget, any final thoughts on this question? Oh, I, I think everybody covered it great. Okay. So uh, one of the folks have asked, uh, who should shepherd this community, this important thing that we all participate in? Who should take on the role of shepherding it? Should it be Cognitect or someone else? Uh, who wants to talk about that? I think that's a key question these days. 
Hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, I, I've thought about this a little bit. So I think, um, I think cognitive tech should definitely play uh, an important role and probably to do some uh, leadership a, a, as they do. Um, I think if we want it to be a community, um, it needs to be um, a number of groups and organizations and people. You know, there's a lot of a lot of companies using Closure, and I think um, I think a, a number of those could ship in to kind of do do the leadership things needed to help help shepherd the, um, the Closure community. Because if it's just Cognitech, then it's not really a community. It's more of like a marketing arm or something. It's you know, it's it's not probably what we're looking for. I think that's a great that's a great point, Bridget. And I'm curious, as somebody who's done a lot of organizing, how do you what kind of activities does somebody if they thought, well, I want to help in this aspect, what kind of things would they do to help shepherd uh, if they weren't from the the Alex Millers of you know or or sort of that involved from a Cognitex perspective? That's a really good question. And um so, uh, you know, I think some people are, are doing that, uh, like uh, Closurians, Slack, um, you know, that didn't come out of, of Cognitech as far as, as far as I know. Um, so I think people can just, you know, take, kind of take the mantle and just run and, and do whatever they need to do and find like-minded people to work with. Um, it's interesting because uh, in the early days of Closure Bridge when I was involved, we actually were large... <laughs> We were largely involved with Cognitech doing that, so um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a little hard for me to talk from my own experience. We we, we actually you know would go meet at the Cognitech office and do that, so uh, maybe somebody else would have an idea about that. Okay, who else wants to? I think one of the. Sorry. I was going to say one of the other really important initiatives I think is um, is what Toby Crawley is currently doing with Clojaz. So he's currently trying to set it up as. Uh, as um, a non-profit, or, or he's trying to have a non-profit organization related to Clojars that will make it easier to actually receive funding for for community things of all types. Um, and so some of that's going to go to fund Clojars, and some of that is going to go to fund um, other other projects for the benefit of the Clojar community. I think it's a really great initiative. It's something that um, Daniel Solano Gomez has also talked a lot about, and uh, I'm really glad to see it actually happening. I hope I hope that can happen. Yeah, Wonderful. yeah. I just wanted to say, you know, I, I think these external organizations are really interesting. I mean, this is not a cognitive tech event, and um, in, in some different world, maybe it could have been, but that's okay. And and, and I personally feel like uh, Rich and Alex and Stu and all the other folks at cognitive tech working on closure do a really good job. And especially after uh, I think it was two years ago, closure conj uh, talk with Brian gets on stewarding the Java language. And, and for me, it made it really clear why uh, it does take a lot of care to move a language forward. And, and I think right now, uh, we can definitely say that closure is in good hands. It's a language. Alex, any thoughts on this? You represent Cognitech. The, and like you said, you work in it every day as the language maintainer, or one of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally don't. Uh, going back to the original question, I don't, I don't really, I don't really like the term shepherding. Um, our community is awesome, and they are going places that don't need any shepherding <laughs> by me, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, I have no, I have no like, a, like sometimes people talk about my role as being a, a, a community organizer or something like that. I hate that word. I have no desire to organize the closure community. <laughs> I. I so uh, the 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 role that I the, the name of the role for my for my personal job description at Cognitech is is a closure catalyst, which for me uh, is really about um, uh, connecting people and trying to uh, move things along and 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 make pieces work better together. And that that's really what I see my sort of general role as. Okay, so so there isn't sort of, uh, and I think everyone knows this, but what you're saying generally as a group is, if you've got ideas, then take the initiative and run with them. You don't have to, uh, obviously we know what kind of community we want to live in and work in, and so aligning with those values is important, but there isn't a master steering committee you've got to get approval from. Right. I think one time long ago Bridget asked me about Closure Bridge and whether we should do Closure Bridge, and I said, I said, it, and she said, I don't know if people will be happy with doing something like that in our community. And I said, I said, you need to be the, you need to be the community that you want to see. If this isn't what you want, if you aren't seeing what you want in the community, then go out there and make it. And awesomely, 
<laughs> she was the catalyst for that and went out and did it. And, uh, I so love thank it. you to her for that. Okay, great. Eric, one a question for you. Um, what's the purpose in building community? Why do you think this has been a focus of closure people thus far? Uh, a lot of effort has gone into it. Well, community is just what people do. If it was just a technology, um, it would be something you could simply study in a book and then go to work and, and program on. Um, but people just want to talk about things they're interested in. They want to be together. We need to work together to do patches and, and bug fixes and uh, libraries. And, and so it's a human endeavor, and we just need a community. Any other thoughts on that from the panel and why it's important to have that community? Um, I think it's um, people organizing around a set of shared values and um, and uh, closure is the, the language, kind of the organizing language which, around which this community uh, uh, organizes, but but I think it's a set of shared values that are possibly related uh, to closure of the programming language that people are, are, are attracted to and that, that form the, the community. Great. Do you know what those shared values are? That's a great question, Eric. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I, I just like to kind of leave that off. I, I would, I would really like to hear what everybody else on the panel has to say. But one thing that I've, I've heard already on the panel, and I've, I've heard this elsewhere in the community, is that uh, people value inclusiveness um, a lot. That seems to be a stated shared, shared value that I see. But what else does everybody think? I think there's a certain level of respect, both for other people, but also for other. Um, other language communities, other um, and ideas from the past as well as from the future, or from now, and things like that. You know, this this interest in good ideas wherever they come from. Yeah, I, I would echo that with just always striving to be better. Great, and, and I think as a community, we're very tolerant of newbies as well. I, I don't think I've ever really seen many people. Tell someone that they're asking a stupid question, either in, in chats online or, or anywhere else. I think it's uh, it's quite it's, it seems to be quite a friendly community for newbies. I think sometimes the technology has some some sharp corners, but I think the community is very uh, is very friendly for newcomers. Yeah, that's certainly been my experience as well, Colin. Well, we've got a question from the audience with a few votes here, so let's do this one. The person says, if you're not working in a closure functional environment, closure slash functional environment. What avenues can you take to try and introduce those ideas <clears throat> into an object-oriented workplace? Who wants to tackle that? Eric. I'm just going to point people out. Eric, how yeah. does this poor guy introduce these wonderful ideas that Clojure brings into his C++, Ruby, whatever uh, group at work? So there's a lot of ways, but I'm, I'm going to mention one that has obviously been powerful in the past, and that's Rich Hickey's talks. Um, those have spread virally and even to other language communities. So if there's a place to start, uh, and, and you are just talking about the ideas, um, you know, th th that's, that's where it's at. I mean, Clojure was based on these really big software engineering ideas that just weren't baked into languages that people were using, that they were just sort of, you had to do them as a discipline. And Clojure has put them in at its core. Uh, so I would start there. Rich Hickey talks. Is there a particular one that you think is a great one to start? Uh, simplicity Matters. That's a, a really good one, especially since that was done at a Ruby conference. Um, so it, it already has a little bit of cachet in the object-oriented world. Great. Who else has had this question possibly in real life? Uh, we've done that at my workplace. Um, uh, I, well, Clojure was already here when, when I got here, but um, there's a number of people who are interested in it. So we did, um, uh, we, you know, we have a Slack room, and uh, we did a book club for Clojure for, for the Grave and True, and we're about to do a book club for uh, Clojure Applied. Okay, great. So finding like-minded individuals and, and working together to learn those things. I've seen some companies have success where uh, 
it suits the organization, you can actually have a small independent project. Uh, you know, just actually putting yourself out there and, and saying you'd like to do something in a different language, uh, try to get approval and, and hopefully kill it on the actual the actual micro project itself. And, uh, and I've seen that at one or two places actually kind of blossom into that they're now starting to move their entire system over to closure. So it works some places, not easy. And in some places where you can't, there are, um, depending on the language, there are sometimes libraries available that will allow you to, because a, a lot of the, a lot of the benefit from Clojure comes from the fact that a lot of these concepts are sort of baked into the language, but you can still apply those concepts to other languages um, to a certain extent. Um, so JavaScript has immutable JS that has immutable data structures, um, and we see companies like Facebook moving towards uh, applying a lot of the Clojure philosophy, if you like, even even inside more traditional languages. So so I think that's a, a sort of you can sort of sneak some of the ideas in through the back door that way as well, and hopefully people start to see the benefit of them. That makes a lot of sense. Alex, you want to round us out? Anything to add on this topic? Uh, not really, because what I did was I joined a new company and told them I wanted to use Closure. So <laughs> I didn't go this route. <laughs> now, I'm curious, does Cognitech get asked this question? How do we introduce these concepts? Because you guys are clearly you know, the masters of the language, and so you're the biggest vendor, my guess, in this space. Do you have folks who come and want help introducing these things to your company, to their company? Uh, yeah, um, so people contact for, for that sort of thing all the time, um, but that's on the consulting arm, and I don't, I don't work over there, so okay. we won't talk <laughs> so I haven't spent much time doing it. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Okay, um, Ryan, what other communities do you ad admire? And, and I'd love to hear from everybody. What other, especially, I guess, technical communities, but what other communities do you admire, and what, where are they doing a great job that we need to emulate? You know, I think probably one of the most interesting ones, and don't, don't, don't shoot me, is uh, uh, I like a lot of the things that the JavaScript community is doing. And actually, uh, this conference, for example, came out of uh, a fellow by the name of Charles Maxwood, who uh, ran some, some JavaScript conferences just like this. And uh, we have a very upbeat and, and happy community, but, but theirs is almost like this hoorah, let's go, everyone do it, let's all pile on this event, let's have events, and uh, it's kind of a, it, we've got energy, but boy, they've got a lot of energy. <laughs> okay, great. How about you, Eric? Are there other communities that you, that you like, that you think we should, uh, uh, should learn from? Um, I don't know. Um, I I don't participate in very many other communities. Uh, I'm I'm trying to think if there's something that's maybe not even technical that I I, I could use as an example, but I don't think so. I th there's a lot of bad examples, but I I don't <laughs> think that's what you're looking for. No, I think we're looking for the good examples. Okay, a couple Thanks. that I I've got a couple that I like. Um, so I'm always impressed by the Python community and how uh, incredibly uh, welcome they are to new people and uh, how they really have a focus on diversity and and uh, some of the things they do like PyCons and PyLadies and some of those things are phenomenal and uh, we've taken uh, inspiration from those for some of the closure events that we do. Um, but I certainly would love to have 3,000 people at a closure conference. That would be awesome. Um, so. Uh, that's one. I think Rust is also doing a fantastic job of uh, building a really great community around some interesting, uh, a really interesting language. So those are two that I've been watching. Excellent. Um, I, I was going to say Python via what I've seen at PyCon um, as well. Also, I will add to that that uh, Guido von Russum has has very actively been um, um, worked towards some of the goals that you just described uh, with Python and, and PyCon. Um, which I think shows a lot of leadership and kind of sets the tone for the community on top of what you already talked about. Um, uh, so, uh, so I'll go for uh, Ruby. I think there's some nice things about the Ruby community um, uh, that um, has some nice things that set it apart, but I think also things that we could emulate, which I actively do because I've just kind of cribbed some of the things Ruby Central has done <laughs> for their conferences, uh, for the conferences I'm involved in. So. Great. Colin, any final thoughts? 
Yeah, one one community that I really like that I've uh, that I've spoken about a bit in my talks is the Elm community. I think they do a really fantastic job of. Um, they have. I think the language is quite interesting. They have a lot of very interesting ideas. Um, I actually I was uh, lucky enough to meet Evan Sablicki and at Curry on the conference last year, and I spoke to him quite a bit. And uh, he was a really interesting guy. He actually gave a really fantastic talk at that conference related to the last question about. Um, how to make functional programming languages mainstream, why they aren't mainstream. You know, if the ideas are so great, why does no one use them? Um, and he, he obviously thinks a lot about that stuff. He's a very thoughtful guy. And, uh, and he also has this, this maniacal drive on the, on the, to the user experience as well. Um, so it, it, actually, I talked at the uh, last conj about error messages. And I used Elm as an example there of, um, of trying to make trying to make the language as friendly as possible to users um, so that everyone has a, he, he really, really thinks about the experience people are having using the language. And I think that's a, that's a great example. Great. Well, we've got a question from the audience. And I'm actually not sure who the best person for this question is. So I'm just going to throw it out there. And this person wants to know, how does ClojureScript affect JavaScript's evolution, if at all? And wanting to know if there's any core Clojure or ClojureScript developers a member of the TC39 committee? I really don't know. So who can help us here? I think the answer is no, but um, they're, they're not. But um, David Nolan tracks that stuff really closely, and, and uh, I know that he's in, uh, in touch with a lot of uh, high-level JavaScript people <laughs> on a very regular basis. So, uh, And it's a two-way communication. I think there's a lot of great things coming from uh, the JavaScript community, especially some of the stuff in like uh, some of the React, obviously, and and some of the other things like Falcor and, and uh, those kinds of projects. And uh, David is doing his best to pull the great ideas happening there into ClearScript and Ohm and other things he's working on. And, and likewise, I think a lot of the things related to immutable data and core async and a lot of those things are flowing back into JavaScript um, as people see it work in ClojureScript. So. Uh, I think it's informal, but there's definitely a communication flow there in both directions. Excellent, excellent. And Alex, while we've got you here, let's just ask you the one question that's pointed right at you. Where's <laughs> Euro Closure 2016 going to be? Do you know? Can you tell us? I, I dropped a comment on there. We haven't. We don't know yet. Um, we've had a really hard time finding venues this year um, that are affordable, and so uh, and sometimes we get the uh, U.S. price when we ask about European venues. Um, so uh, sometimes it helps to have a little person on the ground. We do have a couple of options, two or three options we are narrowed it down to, and I think in this case it's, it's probably more likely to end up in the fall rather than um, spring or early summer just because of the time frames involved. But uh, I'm hoping that we'll have something to talk about in the next few weeks on that. So. Okay, great. Great. Well, somebody from the audience is basically making a suggestion that Cognitech should create a subdivision with uh, which primary role would be to find, recruit, and place closure developers to work in companies using these technologies. Uh, any thoughts on, I guess, two things. One, is that an appropriate role for a company like Cognitech that I'm even interested in? And Alex, you're probably the one to talk about that. And um, how, what is the state of if you want to go to work for a closure company these days, how are you finding those jobs? It sounds like this person is trying to solve that particular problem. I, I don't think Cognitech has any interest in solving that problem. Um, it would be a conflict of interest for us as well, <laughs> since we are closure developers. But um, I mean, we do try to connect people at times uh, when we have clients that are hiring and things like that. But uh, um, certainly, there's uh, Functional Works is out there. They're a closure shop, and they're trying to connect people to functional jobs, and and uh, they do a pretty active uh, job on Twitter and other places, trying to trying to be exactly that a uh, conduit for getting functional jobs in languages like Closure to people that are looking for them. Certainly, I see ads every almost every day on either the closure mailing list or on Twitter or Slack or somewhere else, and so they're certainly out there. Um, so I, I uh, have a little experience hiring in closure. I actually had to hire a couple of times, and each time there was just a flood of people of all levels of experience who wanted to, you know, make a living doing closure. Um, I think that that's the biggest challenge we have now is not enough jobs. There's more people who want to do closure, 
uh, than don't. Now that's in the U.S. I talked to someone in England and they said they had the opposite problem that there aren't enough programmers so we should probably move to England and we'll all have jobs. So Eric, being that you did some hiring, did you find that most of the people that applied were properly skilled and were qualified to do that kind of work? Um, I think it would. It was like uh, any job. There are people who are uh, obviously well below what you want and you realize, oh, I should have described the job better. Uh, and there were people who were super qualified, who who created some of some really famous libraries, who just wanted a job. <laughs> it's kind of kind of sad that after doing so much for the community, they they couldn't find one. Okay. Well, you know, speaking about jobs and and learning, you know, do you what do you guys think? I'd love to hear from everybody on this. On is there enough content in the community? I know that people have talked about uh, how important it is when you start learning language to have the resources. Um, what are your thoughts? Is there enough free content? Is there enough paid content out there? Uh, is there too much? Do we have a flood of it, and it's it's really not um, like we don't need any more? All folks can stop creating it. Well, I, I don't think we have enough of it. So I I, mean, I think that what what I see is that different content, get different content connects with different people. And so there isn't just like one answer for this question. It really depends on how you learn and what sort of things, you know, what you're looking for. And, and uh, not every piece of content is the right for some person at some time. So uh, I think there is a lot of intro content now. And I think there are excellent, every, I mean, I get asked this question all the time. There are great places to point people to. Um, in terms of both books and free online things, I think things are a little sparser in the sort of intermediate um, and advanced categories, uh, and that was one of the reasons that uh, I worked on Closure Applied uh, was to try to hit that category. And I think Eric has been um, doing a fantastic job building content that takes people from beginner to intermediate. So I think he's kind of doing some really important work there too. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I think the more content, the merrier. I think there's still plenty of room for really low-hanging fruit kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I'm talking about like someone could kickstart, kickstart, bootstrap, or whatever you want to call it. They could get their blog started with a uh, just an exhaustive list of uh, an exhaustive post, one post per closure core function. I mean, there's just so much there that isn't surfaced. You search for it on Google, it's not showing up. Where is it? And uh, I, I just think it's not there. Uh, people need to... I guess we don't write enough in our, <laughs> in our community. That is actually, now that you mentioned that, that's one thing I find is the volume of closure writing that I see come across my feeds, it seems drastically lower than other languages, uh, not adjusting for, for size, but I don't see quite as many uh, blog posts where people are, are going in and digging into interesting and weird and bizarre questions. I see lots of beginner to intermediate, and then it drops off pretty heavily after that. I'd also put a plug in for the new closure.org, which I worked on revamping, and which is now open source, and if you want to add new content there in the guide section. Um, there are a whole bunch of issues out there with things that need to be done. I'm sure there are, thing, there are, there are lots of things beyond that that need to be added as well. And so um, I, I, would, I would love to see more content coming in, that more quali you know, high quality content about how to use Closure uh, coming in. Also, a lot of it, um, a lot of it, We're hoping he'll come back. <laughs> Sorry, did I cut out? Yes, say it again, please. Yeah, in, in the, the last year, there's been a lot of work to round out uh, what comes um, in ClojureScript out of the box. And I think that, that has, that's really important because before it was kind of like you had to figure out what was the most recent way that works to get your, you know, your compiler working. Um, so 
the, it, it's coming along. The language just isn't really that old. <laughs> like there's there's not that much um, material out there that has been. I don't want to say it that the the language is moving faster than people can write it about it. Let me put it that way. So that might be okay. Bridget or Colin, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah. So I I, I just have to give another. Uh, vote for Lisp cast is you know really fills a great role for this um, you know as far as uh, a tool for truly learning closure um, uh, things are definitely a lot better than they were a year or two ago there's there are a lot of books out there a lot of materials um, definitely the official documentation um, it's great what's happening with closure.org um, can definitely use some more work uh, we were talking about um, you know shepherding in the community or, or leadership that I, I think one thing um, that could be done is someone, um, whoever the appropriate person to do this is, um, or organization would be um, to uh, maybe uh, pay, you know, a higher uh, developer, evangelist, technical writers, people who have skills in communicating these ideas besides just being an expert in the ideas themselves. I, I think that's something um, that uh, that would be useful. Russ did that with Steve Padre. What's that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it's Steve, Steve Padme. Java did it with Guy Steele. That's hard to talk. <laughs> can we, Clearly can we, we hire, hire Kathy Steele? Sierra, right? Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> we, we could just uh, get a Kickstarter going and some, get some funding built up. But yeah, I think the the Rust is a is a great example because I mean they they basically they recognised that it was important enough to have the documentation. I think there's a lot of good um, there's a lot of good information out there. I think discoverability can be a problem, um, just because it is. Uh, I mean the closure the org. I think I think the changes that have happened to it are great. I would like to see a lot more content on there, and it just for it to be much easier for someone who's looking for something to find it. Um, and I think there is a lot of great content, but it's kind of scattered around a lot of places. Um, I mean, Timothy Baldridge has some fantastic content in his videos, but I think not many people know about them. Um, for example, uh, Lift Card is a great initiative as well, and that, that's much more visible, I think. Um, but for sort of the intermediate advanced content, uh, a lot of Timothy's stuff is really great, and it's not, um, it's not very visible somehow, I think. Um, I've asked and, Tim yeah, to... Sorry, where you go, Alex? I was just going to say I've asked Tim to write some of that up for a closure so. I, I think he did the videos because he hates writing, he said. So it's, uh, yeah. But, uh, but, at but at least have a table of contents on there and pointers to it or something so it, it can be more easily found. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, we've got a question that's a little bit to the side here. Um, it sounds to me like some of the people who use Clojure and uh, .NET are wondering if they're going to be abandoned, if this is really going to continue to be a viable platform. Uh, and I suppose it's a little bit of a, a Cognitech question and maybe a, a community question as well. Um, anybody want to comment on the, the state or how things, um, you know, they see moving forward with .NET and Clojure? I, I mean, I guess I can comment on the... Uh, what I know about it. Um, so, so Cognitech does not work on uh, the Closure CLR at all. Um, at, at some point, as Rich famously said, I got tired of doing twice and decided to do twice as much. And so he dropped the uh, uh, active development on the .NET version. Um, David Miller and, and especially Ramsey Nasser has, has continued to pick up that stuff for his Arcadia Unity project. And um, it's, I don't think they have a 1.8 compatible release yet, but uh, they, there is a 1.7 compatible release. I think someone's been working on the 1.8 stuff. Um, so it is still uh, a port of the language that is um, pretty much up to date. I mean, it has transducers and everything in it, um, and you can use it now. Uh, th the trouble is that it, it's difficult, or historically has been difficult, to get into Microsoft shops to get that stuff considered because it's not sort of part of the Microsoft approved thing. Um, I have had some conversations with uh, over the past year with some people in the Microsoft uh, open source organization. Um, it, it's hard to say. That there seems to be some interest there, but it's hard to judge uh, what exactly it is or where it's going. But uh, uh, 
So I mean, so so I, I'm I'm glad that it exists, and I'm glad that people continue to maintain it, and uh, I I hope that eventually it grows into a really uh, into a valid choice. So I have to imagine with the open sourcing of a lot a large part of the .NET ecosystem, it will probably be a little bit easier, and uh, more tractable to to have those developers and get other people to help. Well, let's let's hope so for those folks who are yeah, Colin. Yeah, there's a bit of a chicken and egg thing happening there. Like a few people have actually asked me about um, about Code to CLR support in cursive, um, particularly since Arcadia came out. I think Arcadia is a great flagship um, flagship product, if you like, or flagship um, project for Code to CLR. Um, and I think it, the I think it's amazing that there is an implementation really made by a couple of people that that tracks mainstream closure so well. Um, when it's used by so few people, I mean, I totally admire their dedication. I really do, and and it's unfortunate that I mean, people have asked me about um, support in cursive. Like, I mean, I have a ton of things I need to do on cursive, and realistically, I can't work on that because just no one uses it, basically. Um, and and it makes me sad. I would I would really like there to be a, um, a CLR alternative, but realistically, I just can't spare the time to work on it. Um, and I suspect that's true of a lot of other tools as well. I mean, it's very hard to justify the investment in, in a lot of the tooling around the language, and, and just that goes for pretty much everything related to that implementation, I think. I mean, documentation and, and everything sort of associated with it, it's very hard to justify spending the time on it if, if there are so few people using it. So hopefully if there are more users coming into it, perhaps via Arcadia, um, that situation might start to change. Excellent. Okay, well, we've, we've got about 10 minutes or less, uh, and I want to make sure we hit on this particular point because it's come up um, in my own research and uh, we've had some other feedback from folks. Uh, there's a big lack of diversity in our community, and we're not alone, right? We know that diversity, and we talked about one of our values being inclusionary, but how, if this, this problem, how can we begin to make real change and real strides to move forward with uh, with impacting things here. Um, so I'd love to hear the community, the, the panelists' thoughts on this particular thing. So this is something that I've thought a lot about. Um, we, we do have a big problem. Um, so we, we've all talked about the, the shared values of the closure community and, and over and over again said inclusiveness is an, is an important value to us. And, and I hear that from a lot of people too. I think that's that is truly a thing in the closure community. And, and everyone here, including me, said, oh, well, we feel really included. And, you know, people are very welcoming and people are very friendly. Um, people are very welcome to newcomers. I think the closure community is welcoming and inclusive to people like us. So the people who are on this panel have not had this problem. You know, like, like we've, we've been included, we've felt included. And I think there are a lot of people who are, who are not feeling included. Um, and so I've done a lot of um, being visible and doing the work with Closure Bridge that I did in the past. Um, I've talked to a lot of people, so a lot of people who are new or um, have been trying to get into the community or, or have been for a while and are members of underrepresented groups. And, and I will say I, that the, the, the opinions expressed by this panel do not match at all what I've heard from them. So. Um, so, and some of them are actually kind of confused. They're like, oh yeah, I've heard that the closure community is really friendly, but that's not the experience that I had. Um, some things that I've heard is, oh, it's people are very unapproachable. Um, uh, some people describe that there, it feels like there's really like kind of cliques or in-groups and out-groups. Um, and, you know, I just, I really don't feel included with those people. And, and, it's, and it's just an interesting contrast that I hear this from, from, from members of underrepresented groups compared to what I hear, and I hear from a lot of people in the closure community. And again, it's also my experience that I did feel included. Um, so um, I think there's a few, a few things going on. One is, although we state that we, we um, value inclusiveness, something that I've, I've heard pervasively throughout the closure community and led to me asking that question to Alex that he <laughs> talked about before, which was, by the way, one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten in my life. Um, uh, so um, I, I've heard, okay, I, I've had this conversation with people throughout the community. Um, I was a bored Java programmer or whatever, 
Um, and I found closure. I, I looked. I looked at all these different languages and tried out these different things. And I found closure, and it was and it was great. And here I am at this conference or whatever, and um, oh, here are all the people like me who shared the same experience that I have. Um, and wow, I'm so glad I'm here, and I don't have to deal with, I don't know, all you know the unwashed masses I have in the past or something. I know, like there'll be some sentiment of like, are those. I'm, and I'm just making an example here, like, oh, dumb Java programmers or whatever. Like, I've, I've heard this from people so many times, that it's, and I've, I've had this conversation with so many people, and so although we say that we value inclusiveness, in some ways we really do, in some ways we really, we do, some, in some ways we really are, um, I think there's also this kind of exclusive, exclusivity, exclusive group feeling also to it. It's kind of at the same, we do have it at the same time, which, which is, which I find interesting, and I think that 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 um, I'm in this special club now um, thing gets communicated to newcomers um, and and we didn't none of us here <laughs> had that experience and so so we don't know about it um, but I hear about that uh, from people a lot well I also hear a lot of people having really friendly good experiences too um, so so I think that's part of it another thing is is that um, you know a lot of people came in through the open source community or came in through developing the language um, and I think there's a lot of people, like underrepresented groups tend to, tend to not have as much opportunity uh, to, to have the time to do things like that for free. Um, so I think one thing is that we need to be hiring people from underrepresented groups, and, and I, I don't see a lot of that happening, um, and which I think is really unfortunate. I think there are great people out there who can be hired um, and uh, can be offered positions at market rates, which also I don't see happening. Um, and so, you know, more people get hired, I think the more people will be there in the community, and the more numbers come up, the, the less unapproachable it seems to people from other groups. Um, so anyway, I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> I've thought about this a lot, so. Thank you, Bridget. Much appreciated. Who else would like to talk about this? Well, I, well, I, well um, I mean, I would second everything that Bridget has to say. <laughs> um, Lynn and I have have spent a, a ton of time at Cognitech working on um, the, the conference angle in particular, um, and Bridget helps with a ton of that as well, and, and so thanks to her for uh, helping us out with that as well. Um, and it, it's uh, something that, it, like, just saying, you know, I, I want new people and I, I, want, I, I feel inclusive doesn't actually change anything. So uh, doing the actual work of um, outreach and uh, making sure that people actually do feel included is is really hard and I don't I don't uh, claim that I'm any uh, guru of that um, it's something that we're uh, learning and getting better at as we go but um, it's something that uh, I, I can say that at least Cognitech is it, it feels is important and is willing to commit a significant amount of time and resources uh, for for Lynn and I to reach out and and, and do that kind of work um, we, we sent out Closure West speaker notifications today, and unfortunately I don't have the, the list isn't public yet because we're still waiting to hear back from speakers and stuff, but um, I will say that I think uh, the efforts we, we put forth for Closure West this year, uh, which were really significantly greater than we've done, and uh, we've been doing this work for uh, over a year, but I, I mean, we really, I think, did uh, stepped up our game significantly with this conference, and it really paid off. Um, the, the submissions that we got were... Um, we got significantly more submissions from from women and from people of color, and that's reflected in the final the final results, which uh, you know we'll have posted next week. But um, the, the, but that's just the first stage, you know. It's just the, the leading the leading edge of, uh, yeah, of uh, doing that outreach. Um, I want, can I, I just was, ask a question it, on that a little bit? Uh, sure, go ahead. I was curious, you know, I've kind of been thinking like there. There's outreach that can happen kind of at this high level uh, from people like you and I that are running these conferences. Uh, what, can, what can people that are on the ground as an everyday closure developer do to help? Because they, they can't hold a conference and, and make that kind of outreach. I, it's really, I mean, the, the number one thing that we found to be useful is personal connection. It's a matter of reaching out and talking to someone um, that you think might be interested in closure, the closure community, and and really uh, welcoming them in, and um, just as Bridget said, it's not like I, I, it's not the in club is not the right way to do that. It's really to say, you know, that 
uh, to talk about the benefits of closure and and uh, and to just show them that it's great tech and and uh, uh, get them interested in it from a from a technology point of view uh, and get them involved in it and and it's something that everyone all of us in the community need to be doing um, you know on Twitter or on in your conversations at user groups and at conferences and things like that, and uh, it, it's it's not it's not, and it's hard sometimes to go reach out to somebody who doesn't look like you and, and welcome them in, um, and it's doubly hard for them not to be welcomed in. So um, we're the ones who have to make the effort uh, when we do that. Uh, I do want to give a couple shout outs to companies that I think are doing extra work in this area. Uh, I know Democracy Works has done a lot of work to to hire interns and and to um, help develop people, which I think is an, un, an under-appreciated uh, skill of bringing new people into the community and be able, really being willing to, to sort of mentor them and have them become senior people. Uh, and then also Eighth Light uh, does a fantastic amount of uh, internships and uh, really works, and I don't, understand, I don't know anything about their program, I just know from what I see coming in through conferences and stuff like that, they've really brought in a ton of uh, they really work hard at this, and and I don't think they're recognized enough for that. So, so I mentioned that. Great, great, Alex. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, thank you to everybody. We need to wrap up here. Uh, we're at time, but I want to thank all of our guests uh, and just really, just once again reiterate that uh, you know closure. The, the Cognitech and the Closure community is one of the strongest things about it. And so uh, I appreciate all the practical advice and all the forward thinkingness we heard here today. And I uh, look forward to seeing everybody at the next session. So back over to you, Ryan. Yeah, well, you stole my thunder there, Marcus. I was going to invite everyone to. Well, feel free to do that. that. So yeah, so we're, we're wrapped up for the day. Um, for those of you that are joining just for this uh, session online public, thank you for coming. Uh, and if you've been attending the conference all day, then uh, I hope to see you first thing in the morning. And hopefully it's not too early for you. It's about 8 a.m. for me, and I don't envy the people living on the West Coast. Eight in time shift. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>